Hello and welcome to the Real Estate Macro Podcast. Joining me today is Brian Briscoe. Brian, welcome to the call. Hey, thanks, Douglas. I appreciate your time. And Brian, I, I really uh, don't know if folks know you that well. Uh, it, I've had a portion of, uh, you have an epic meetup every Friday, and that's how I met Brian. Um, Brian, can you tell us a little bit how you got uh, your background a little bit? And I would love to go all the way back to your Marine Corps service, because I, I find your your military yeah. experience very fascinating and, and how you got uh, into the business. Yeah, so um, I told somebody my background yesterday on a podcast, and they said, wow, that is extremely unique. But um, I had two degrees in math, bachelor's and master's in math from the University of Utah, big Utah fan for football, if, if anybody knows me. And I was in a PhD program in math when, you know, terrorist attacks of September 11th happened. And, you know, on September 12th, I was at a recruiter's office saying, you know, I want to go active duty in the Marine Corps. You know, the, the tr uh, truth was I was actually a reservist prior to that. But, you know, September 12th, you know, I, I started looking at, OK, what's it going to take to go active duty now, um, you know, serve my country full time instead of part time. And, and that started what ended up being a 20-year career with the Marine Corps. Um, I don't think it was ever intended to be a 20-year career until I was about my 12-year mark. But uh, um, along the way, I, I would say my, my very first duty station, I was in Okinawa, Japan. And, you know, a lot of people were talking about this Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, you know. And so mm -hmm. picked that up, read it, you know, and just kind of lit a fire. And I started... Um, thinking as big as I could, which at the time was single family homes, you know, and so um, my my plan was, okay, as long as I'm active duty, I'm going to be moving every two to three years. And so every time I move, I'll buy a house. <clears throat> and so, you know, fast forward 10 years, you know, I ended up with three single family investment properties. So it wasn't like a ton, but it was proof of concept. You know, I, I saw, hey, I've, I've got cash flow streams coming in. They were really tiny, not really impactful. But what was, what was impactful was the equity buildup over time, you know, and I'm sitting on, you know, a couple of different a couple of houses with six figures in equity. And I'm like, man, I really need to double down on this. And so started researching how to scale and from there landed in multifamily. And that was really, really it for me. And so 2018, so it's been four plus years. I signed up for a, a, one of those, you know, high price tag coaching programs, you know, formed a company. We syndicated nine properties with 630 units. Um, left that company earlier this year because I wanted to go a different direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as of now, I've been into 12 different deals, um, about 1,100 total units. And, you know, we're we're buying and selling at the same time. So, you know, unit count fluctuates, you know, but, uh, you know, total total units, uh, about 1,100. And, uh so, Brian, basically, you've, uh, as I understand it, you've got more of a fund to funds model, uh, essentially, or a fund for the fund model now? Yeah. So, I, I started out with just like the straight, you know, I'll call it vanilla syndications, if you know, if people know what syndications are. Um, and then about three months ago, I started a fund. It's a, it's a customizable fund is what it's called, or it's also called a segregated fund. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it allows me to you raise capital for other people a little more, you know, streamlined in a way. And that's actually the name of the company. But uh, anyway, yeah. So, so if depending on what kind of deals I do, if it's my own property that I'm raising capital for, you know, the fund is just a really good place. I don't have to redo my, my syndication paperwork every time I do a deal. So it cuts down the cost. And when you cut down the cost, it actually makes things better for the investors. And it also gives me the option of, you know, raising capital for other people. Um, and th there's there's lots of ways that I can do it. It ends up being a really flexible vehicle to be able to help people invest and to be able to help me, you know, pursue what I want to do. And Brian, about, about that shift, um, yeah. when you were uh, making the decisions of like moving from syndication to more a, a fund model, what are, what are the big differences you see so far? Uh, and I think there's a unique product out there. And I'm, I'm not afraid to say Avester uh, is an incredible mm -hmm. product. We're actually looking at it pretty close to two. Yep. Uh, and we're interviewing Baudry pretty soon, too, just to get him on the record. Uh, but would love to uh, hear about your experiences with uh, building that out and, and what was that like? 
You know, so we, we still syndicate. So mm -hmm. it's it's just the the fund ends up being a vehicle for funding syndications. Um, you know, and and the the fund that's that's set up, you know, you can set up a 506B fund or a 506C fund, you know, so um, it, it allows you to to raise money for 506B deals through your 506B fund or for 506C deals through a 506C fund. And, and something that's really interesting is if you look at the definition of accredited investors, um, if an entity has more than $5 million uh, in, in assets, it's automatically accredited. So one thing that I really like about the fund model is um, you know, my, my attorney says I'm not supposed to talk about, you know, 506C funds, but mm -hmm. uh, hypothetically, if you were to set up a 506B fund and raise $5 million, that fund is automatically accredited. And then you can start investing 506B dollars into 506C deals. And so what that means for the average person is if you are a non-accredited investor and you want to be able to get into these deals that are only open to accredited investors, you find a 506B fund that has 5 million in assets or is on the up and up, you know, towards 5 million assets, 5 million in assets, and you will be able to, to invest in these deals that are only for the accredited investors. So that, that's one thing I really like about it. Um, and what, what the customizable fund allows you to do, and I, I did set mine up through Avestor, uh, I do. I, Badre, Badri and Sanjay are awesome. I love them. They're the co-founders of, of Avestor. Um, most attorneys who do syndications can set up a similar fund. It's just called mm -hmm. a segregated fund. Um, but Badri and Sanjay bring the platform and you know everything else along with it to make it uh, make it easy. But anyway, what's what's nice about the customizable fund is I think most people who invest in syndications are accustomed to seeing individual deals. Okay, looking at one property or a small portfolio for its merits and saying, okay, I like the city, I like the, the sponsorship group, I like the deal, I'm going to invest. But what, what the customizable fund does is it, is it makes each deal a separate thing inside the fund. So they put walls around each deal inside the fund. And so if you only want to invest in, let's say, my, my Houston deal, then you invest in the Houston deal. And if you want to pass on the Dallas deal, you pass on the Dallas deal, right? And if I got a Denver deal coming up that you're interested in, you know, you can, you know, make your decision on each one of these, these deals. So it, unlike traditional fund of funds models, I mean, when you invest in the fund of funds, your money is basically diluted or not diluted, spread across all of the assets in the fund. Mm -hmm. So this gives the investors a little more flexibility to invest where they want inside one vehicle and something else that i really like and i'm excited to see how this works um is the fund like most indications the sun fund has a fifty thousand dollar minimum investment mm -hmm. and that what that means is if you've invested in one deal with fifty thousand and the second deal comes along and especially for non-accredited investors you know you may not have fifty thousand for the second deal you know three months after you've just invested but if you've already hit the fund minimum and you have, say, 20000 now you can invest in the second syndication because you've already hit the fund minimum. OK, so you don't have to hit the fund minimum again to get into the second deal. So that's that's one thing that I, I think for especially for the non-accredited investors, um, I, I think investing through this customizable fund makes a lot more sense than plugging straight into uh, syndications. And it, it really is interesting, too. It gives uh, a little bit more uh, choice uh, that you wouldn't otherwise have. I guess in a blind pool, you literally, you know, like, hey, you know, the manager go find some stuff and you, you really have way less input. This this way, it seems the investor has still a lot of control over what, what they go into. And I, I think yeah. that's really correct. Yeah. And yeah, the investor still maintains the control. And I've talked with a lot of a lot of people who are passively investing, and most of them are a little um, a little nervous investing in the these blind funds. They're a little nervous putting money into something where they don't know what the deal is. They don't know what the city is. They don't know what the asset type is or asset class is. You know, they don't know if it's a stabilized or a value add. I mean, there there's there's actually a lot of benefits to pooling properties in funds like that. But for some reason, a lot of people have been accustomed to the idea of, 
I like this property better than that property, you know, for whatever reason. Um, so th this does allow them to kind of pick and choose what they want to put money into. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it is, it is more flexible. Um, and then I can choose to put a lot of different types of opportunities inside this fund as well, you know, so um, the, the fund is set up around multifamily, but I can put money into a debt, you know, so, so if somebody else has a fund, like a debt fund, or, or maybe, maybe notes on multifamily, mm. you know, for example, if we were to, you know, put a note on like a seller carry back for a, for somebody and, and sell off shares, we could do that. So there's a lot more flexibility. Um, and I'm ac actually talking with a group right now. Haven't, you know, haven't made any decisions, but there, there's a group that's uh, actually doing a blind fund and I'm considering raising money through my fund for their blind fund. So it does give the investors a lot of opportunities. Um, it, it's basically, I, I start listening to my investors, see what they want. And if I don't have a product for them, you know, as the fund manager, I can go look for the type of projects that uh, the investors are looking for. And Brian, it seems like with with this uh, vehicle, you would have the ability to um, be ultimate in flexibility. And I think that, that fascinates me that you're even able to, to participate in a blind pool that, that if you know the manager, like, for example, mm -hmm. I think Amy Tiemann is, is a rock star investor and, and, mm -hmm. and she's got a new fund. And saying being able to co-invest with her, for example, would be incredible because you've got yeah. you've got the ultimate in flexibility, and it sounds like it's an incredible, uh, incredible yeah. Tool, uh, opportunity. Yeah, and I mean, in the talk, talking about the flexibility, you know, let, let's say I go out and talk to Amy, and Amy doesn't want to, you know, a lot of times, you know, people when when they raise capital, they get a slice of the GP, they get some other responsibilities inside the GP, so they're not violating broker dealer laws. But let's say, let's use Amy as an example. Let's say I go to Amy and say, hey, you know, I, I want to raise capital for you. And she says, no. Well, guess what? I can still use my fund to invest in her deal. Right. I can I can raise capital and plug that money in as an LP. And so I can use my fund as an LP as well and still put people into that deal, regardless of whether the GP is going to give me GP shares or not. Now, obviously, I, I want to get paid. You know, I'll tell you that there, there's a little switch in the fund where basically what I've what I told my investors and what I'll hold to is, you know, if, if I'm raising capital, and I'm getting GP interest in a property, I'm not going to charge a fund manager fee. You know, there, there's the option for me to charge that fund manager fee. Um, but if I find a deal, you know, and there, there's a lot of deals that have tiers, for example. So, um, you know, you, you've probably seen them, but a lot of larger deals will have better returns for higher level investors. So if you invest a hundred thousand, you know, 50, 100, 200,000, you're just getting the regular tier. If you're investing 500,000 or a million, you're probably going to have a higher pref. You may have more generous splits, but you're going to get an IRR that's, you know, significantly better than the $50,000 investor. And so what that allows me to do as a fund manager is, you know, if I can raise a million dollars for a deal and hit that highest tier, you know, now instead of giving the investors an eight pref, I can give the investors like a 12 pref depending on the deal, you know. So it's it's something that, you know, there, there is added flexibility there. Um, I don't necessarily have to be a GP, but, you know, end of the day, you know, I, I can pool investors money, go to the sponsors and say, hey, I'm going to bring you a million dollars. You know, I don't have to tell them how many people are in there or who's in there. I can if I want um, and if the investors, you know, allow me to. But uh, um, end of the day, I've got the flexibility to invest, you know, the fund as an LP or to come in as a, as a GP member as well. And uh, Brian, uh, just so uh, people know, I, I don't know if people know this or not. You have uh, a, uh, co a coaching community on the background. If people are, are wanting to, to transition into the uh, real estate business and want to learn from you. And tell us a little about your decision to create a coaching program and and how that how that's gone for you. Yeah, that, that came 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 by came by slowly. I think, um, excuse me. Uh, I think the uh, at, at the beginning I started posting a lot on social media. Hey, this is what I'm doing. You know, I'm I'm looking for properties. I joined this coaching program and. 
Um, you know, early on, I may have posted a 506B deal because I was really excited and I didn't know the rules, but yeah. let's not talk. Yeah. But I started posting about what I was doing. I was writing like blog articles and I was going to like other like Facebook groups that established Facebook groups and asking the owners of the group or the or websites, hey, can I write a blog article for you? And you know, I started getting a lot of traction, but what I didn't realize at the time is, you know, I was looking for passive investors, but I was going to groups that had a bunch of people who wanted to do what I was doing. Right. And so I started getting a lot of calls from people who wanted to learn how to syndicate. And what I found out is I really enjoyed talking to those people. You know, I, I was, you know, re re rewind the clock 25 years or 20 years. I was in a PhD program because I wanted to teach, you know, mm -hmm. and, and math was what I decided to teach. It wasn't, you know, looking back at it, it wasn't really exciting for me. I just wanted to teach. Mm -hmm. um, and I was good at math, but I do enjoy teaching. And so how it came about was I would get a, you know, 20 minute call with somebody that asked a couple of questions. And after, you know, a couple of months of doing that, I realized I was getting the same question a lot. And so what I started doing is when I would get off the phone with somebody, I'd be like, man, I've been asked that question three times in the last month. I would write down the answer. You know, and I would just, you know, a couple of paragraphs and um, usually I'd send a follow up email to the person that I was on the call with. I'm like, hey, after talking with you, I'm like, the answers I gave you were kind of off the cuff. I thought about this a little bit more. Here's here's a better response. And I started saving those. And that was the baseline for the content in Tribe of Titans, you know, and um, there, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of content based around, you know, how to get started in the business um, I do have a capital raising course. I'm working on an underwriting course, um, almost done, but uh, we, we do weekly calls on underwriting. We do the weekly networking group on Fridays, but there, there's a lot of, lot of content in there and a lot of good people in there who are, you know, looking to partner up or looking to, to help people out. So anyway, it's uh, the tribe of Titans. You, you can find it at you know, the tribe of titans.info, or if you reach out to me, you know, I can, I can send anybody who's listening to the podcast, um, a link that'll give them a 30 day trial and full disclosure, there is a small subscription, you know, it's 40 bucks a month. So, you know, less than a coffee a day. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I can promise the, the content's worth it guys, uh, had a chance to get to know Brian quite a bit. And I explicitly endorse Brian Briscoe in, in all things multifamily. So, uh, <laughs> really happy to have you on the podcast and and again i'm excited to hear about your coaching program for folks i think it's a, it you know some of them out there i don't think are worth the worth the investment but there are mm -hmm. some and, and i think brian uh is a good choice if you're going to really commit that. to the business and it is a commitment folks um mm -hmm. but if you want to do that uh brian is an excellent choice and right um speaking of growing um you you're looking at some additional markets and um you, you, it's possible you might even hire right now. Can we go through that that uh, process yeah. of deciding uh, what you know what you're looking for? And, and in fact, especially folks, if you meet this box, uh, send send uh, Brian a, re a resume. I promise you'd be a great boss. Um, and and so Brian, can we talk a little bit about what you're looking to do and uh, expand your mm -hmm. business? Yeah. So um, I mean, I mentioned I, I retired from the Marine Corps about a year ago. That translated to me moving across the country, and that was part of me leaving. My, my previous group. And so, you know, about six months ago, I started thinking, okay, you know, I'm leaving this group right now. What's next for me? And I, I think my, my heart's always been in Utah, you know, Salt Lake City. Mm. Whenever, you know, I'm in Idaho Falls right now because that's where my wife's family's at. And um, it's, you know, my, my wife and I both are lukewarm on Idaho. You know, we, mm. we love being close to family, but we're just kind of lukewarm on Idaho. But my heart's always been in Salt Lake it's growing tremendously. I mean, we've got a lot of tech companies that are moving to, they call it Silicon Slopes because it's the new Silicon Valley, mm. just on the side of a mountain instead of in a valley. But uh, that's right. Um, anyway, there, there's a lot of growth there and the, the city has like doubled in size in the last 15 years. So um, most people are saying it's still going to grow. And so Salt Lake City um, is, is where I really want to start looking. And I'll, I'll rewind the clock a little bit about how I came to this decision. I was at a conference in July and there there's one guy that uh, I don't know why he likes me, you know, but he's got thousands and thousands and thousands of units. And every time he knows that I'm in Dallas, he, you know, he invites me over to the office. We go out and eat lunch and, and have a good time, but he invited me to dinner and along with him, 
there were several people at that table that had thousands and thousands of units, you know, and had been doing this for, you know, a dozen years, you know, and so I'm sitting around this table. And what I realized is all these guys had one thing in common, you know, they all focused on one Metro, you know, and one guy actually focused on one Metro for five or seven years and then branched out to a second Metro. And what I realized is they knew their market so well that, you know, brokers were giving them first shot at everything. Number one, number two, you know, they, they knew history on a lot of properties, you know? And so it, it just, it just clicked with me and it made sense that, you know, for, for Brian Briscoe's future, I want to be, you know, neck deep in a single Metro and Salt Lake mm -hmm. city makes the most sense. And so, um, so that, that was one, one thing that I, that I learned from someone who was, or a group of people that were ridiculously successful. And then about a month ago, I was at another conference and I was talking to someone else who's got, you know, I, I think he's sitting around 7,000 units right now. And uh, that's one of the great things about hosting a podcast is you talk to people who are like head and shoulders above you. And uh, um, anyway, I was telling him, hey, this is what I want to do. And he said, hey, what's stopping you? I'm like, well, right now I'm just a one man show and I've got podcasts. I've got this educational community. I've got the fund and, you know, it's I, I need a partner to help me. And he just said, well, why partner? Why don't you just hire somebody? It's quicker, mm -hmm. it's easier, and you call the shots. And you know, he's, he's got several employees of his own, several people mm -hmm. who are working for him. He's like, trust me, just hire someone. And I started thinking about it. I'm like, I can do that, you know? Uh, so uh, yeah, next step for me is I'm looking for an acquisition specialist, you know, somebody who can interact with brokers, you know, find deals and underwrite um, in, in the Salt Lake city Metro. And if you're familiar with Salt Lake city, you know, I'm talking Ogden to Provo, that's kind of the, you know, opening up, uh, to a couple different counties, but, uh, um, that's what I'm looking for. And, you know, my, my goal is, you know, by the end of, uh, Q1 of 23 to, to have somebody in place. So yeah, if you're interested in that, you know, reach out to me. Um, I, I do want people who are local to Salt Lake. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that is one requirement. That, that'll be awesome. And I think, uh, again, I can't, can't stress. I think, uh, uh, I've gotten a chance to know Brian and I would say we have an incredible boss, but, um, and, and, and Brian to that, uh, to that end, I love, I'm recently fascinated. I don't know if you saw my, uh, UDA, uh, podcast, but, uh, uh, the impact of the Marine Corps and your leadership and how, how that, uh, has got like created a, a backdrop for your leadership skills and and how that's translated into uh, multifamily for you. You know, I, I think the the Marine Corps has one of the best leadership academies in the world. You know, it's uh, um, I probably went through a full year worth of you know leadership training, and then you know they they stress mentorship. You know, you you mentor the the subordinate leaders under you. So I, I had a lot of people who helped me out, but. On the flip side, I've, I've had a lot of people that, you know, I've had as bosses and I'm just like, I hate that guy, you know? Um, so, you know, just you, you move every two to three years and your boss moves on, on average, 18 to 24 months. That's how long people are in command. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I had a lot of opportunities to learn leadership, um, you know, to, to lead Marines. You know, I've several combat tours where I've had, you know, dozens or hundreds of Marines working for me. And, you know, trying to accomplish a mission. So I think a lot of things, number one, we're, we're 100% focused on mission accomplishment. I mean, that is that is our ultimate goal. And we don't settle for anything less. You know, if, if we have a mission and it's doable, we're going to do it is, is the answer. So that, that's number one. Number two, I think we do a really good job at risk assessment in, in, in the Marine Corps. I mean, this it, it's not business. It's life and death when we are in combat situations. And so that kind of forces us to take a really good look at what we're doing, analyze the risk, where can things go wrong, and then how do you mitigate? And we're, we're going into, I, I don't know if we're in a recession, if we're going into a recession, I think, you know, someday somebody will put dates on it and say, this is when we started, when we stopped. But that's that's exactly what you need right now in multifamily is somebody who can, you know, look at the environment we're in and say, where are the risks? You know, where can things go wrong? And, you know, I've done that for 20 years. You know, every time we did an exercise, every time we did an operation, every time we did anything, 
you know, we had to do a formal risk assessment. And that was part of the approval process for getting anything done was, and here is our risk assessment. We, we estimate this to be low risk, or we estimate this to be medium risk after mitigating factors. And, um, the question at the end of the day was always, is the juice worth the squeeze? You know, mm. are, are we, is, is the objective important enough that we can, we can handle the level of risk that we're, we're going to take. So, so yeah, I think uh, between the two mission accomplishment and, you know, risk mitigation, you know, th those are the two biggest things that I, that I take from, you know, 20 years of Marine Corps leadership. And Brian, in terms of what you're uh, moving forward, Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you talk about, uh, working, working for you, for example, uh, what are, what are the, like the core, uh, things that you want to pass on in terms of, okay, in addition, because I, again, number one, I think that, that that's, that's a under underrated understanding is a uh, risk assessment in, mm -hmm. in how we are, you know, cost benefit and ACE. I just lost your audio. Brian, in terms of uh, what, uh, in addition to risk and risk assessment, mm -hmm. in terms of what you'd like to like pass on in terms of a leader, um, mm -hmm. I'm always fascinated on that too. What are what are we looking to pass on to the generation uh, that's coming up under you know coming up that's that's yeah. uh, you know the the new tribe so to speak. And and I also really appreciate the mentorship thing. I think I've been very I can't even tell you how lucky I've been with some of the mentors I've had. Yeah. Um, what do you think are some of the keys that you want to pass on? You know, in, in addition to the the things that I that I just mentioned, I, I would say, you know, this comes from you know Stephen Covey's habits. Okay. You know, be proactive, and it, it's something the Marine Corps teaches a lot too. In, in the Marine Corps, it's the idea of uh, you know centralized command, decentralized control, where okay. you know, you want people to be proactive. You want people to you know, make decisions on their own based on, you know, what the intent of your, your, your higher headquarters is in, in, in Marine Corps speak or the commander's intent in Marine Corps speak. So, you know, as, as a boss, you know, I need to be very clear with what our objectives are, but as, as a subordinate, you know, I want the subordinates acting within my guidance without having to be directed in every single thing that they do, you know? So, um, you know, I, and I, I've had, I've had some people work for me that just don't get this concept. It's like, you know, I don't, I don't want to tell you everything you have to do, you know, and if, if you want to work for me, you know, I need to be able to say, you know, for example, with the acquisitions job, I want to acquire an, a, an apartment complex between 10 and $15 million. I want it to be a B class value add property in these certain areas. Mm -hmm. And give that guidance and then they go, you know, they, they, they reach out to the brokers, they reach out to, and they, they do everything. And they don't just sit back and say, well, you need to send me something, sir, mm. you know, or something like that. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I wanted to be able to give guidance and have people act within that guidance and not be afraid to make mistakes, you mm -hmm. know, and that's, uh, you know, I think when I, when I joined the Marine Corps, there was this big shift away from this zero tolerance policy where, you know, leaders expected perfection, but, you know, and so that I got a healthy dose of, you know, reality and it's like, nobody's perfect, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, so allow subordinates to act, allow subordinates to, to do what they think's best because they're the one they're they're They are where the rubber meets the road. They're the ones, you know, taking machine gun fire, you know, you don't want them to have to call back up and say, Hey boss, we're getting shot at right now. Can we shoot back? You know, type stuff. But right. uh, you know, it's it's the same thing in 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 multifamily or in any industry. You know, I, I want people to act within their purview to do their job within the guidance that they've been given, and then you know, report back. Hey, this is what, what this is what we did yesterday. This is what we did today. And something that I've always that I that I've been doing recently is you know people who work for me at the end of the day they give me an email wrap up you know this mm. is what I did so there there is some accountability there so you know a morning morning call and an evening wrap up and it's just yeah. like okay you know did you did you get done what you told me you're going to do so there there's also a little bit of accountability there as well yeah that was interesting and and Richard Wilson uh, with the uh, Family Office Club had a really great uh, similar style he said 
uh, email me in the morning the five five objectives, and at the end of the day, email me on on how how far you made it on your five objectives. I was like, that's pretty great. And yeah. delegation is not my strong suit, so that's one of the things in terms of moving forward. I'm 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 excited to learn from folks that are great at uh, the delegation piece, and uh, I really appreciate that that aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, and with with, with the delegation, I mean, that's something that I struggle with. You know, I I tend to delegate too quickly without a lot of information and then have people come back to me and say, and I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. So, yeah. So one, one thing I'm working on personally is to make sure that, uh, the, when I do delegate tasks, they understand exactly what I'm looking for. If, if I'm flexible on, on what I'm looking for, I'll tell them if I want a specific objective, I need to tell them what that specific objective looks like. So, so yeah, part of, part of that delegation is you got to paint the picture of mm. what success looks like. You know, this is, you know, once again, going back to, you know, something out of the Marine Corps, you know, the final, final result desire, final objective. I don't remember. I've, I've been yeah. retired too long, but <laughs> yeah, this, this is what I want. Yeah. You know, when, when, when all the dust settles, this is the picture of what things should look like and, you know, let people go towards that picture. And if you give them a clear picture of what things should look like at the end, it's a lot easier for them to say, this is what I need to do to get there. Yeah, it's really strange. Uh, in, in, and again, I remember this in composition class, the who, what, when, why, where. It's almost like journalism almost. It's like, you know, you paint that who, what, why, when, where. Here's here's your email yep. with the who, what, why, when, where. And let's go get it. And I, I really appreciate yep. that that dialogue because it's really helpful to, to... Wasn't that your LinkedIn post yesterday? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, yeah. very much in line with what we're working on in terms of improving, my, uh, improving our communication on what we're doing. It's... Uh, uh, the, uh, what did Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling, uh, the six honest men I keep, and it's one of the better, yep. better, better poems I've read, um, yeah. and, and highly, highly recommend it. Um, yep. Brian, thank you so much. I wanted to thank, uh, thank you for coming on and, and for folks that want to reach out to you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, email super easy, uh, Brian at streamline capital group.com. And that will be um, in the, in the notes. Yep. Uh, my LinkedIn profile, you know, some people, if, if you're a little reluctant to reach out, follow me on LinkedIn um, or, you know, subscribe to the podcast or YouTube channel, Diary of an Apartment Investor. And, you know, it depends on what you want. If you want to talk to me, email or DM me on LinkedIn. Um, if you're not quite to the point to where you're, you know, ready for a conversation, you know, hit that follow button on LinkedIn, hit that subscribe button on, on your podcast app. And, you know, you'll, you'll get my thoughts several times a week. And Brian, and by the way, I almost forgot to mention that uh, you've, you've recently hit a, a nice uh, uh, goal line for your, or a nice, uh, a nice benchmark for your podcast. Well, I'm almost there. My, my goal was to have, you know, a total of 200,000 downloads by the end of the year. And I'm at 193,000 right now. So it's, uh, we, we've got three and a half weeks left in the year. So, you know, I've got to have a slightly better than average month to hit that goal. So, you know, if, if you're listening to this and uh, you want to help me hit my goal, you know, go to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast and listen to a couple of episodes. So um, and then, you know, let me know. Absolutely, folks. It is worth the listen. And, and, and Brian, uh, love your 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 concept because you have an experienced investor along with a, a newbie. And I think the dialogue is really good. And, and also, it's always good if you, you know, sometimes you get in the business and you've been around it all, all, all the time. And then somebody asks a, a great question that doesn't know the business. And it's like, you know, it's never a bad idea to continue to, uh, you know, what, yeah. I think I know that and then ask a great question. You're like, well, Maybe that's there's a little more to it than I than I thought. You know, and from from a content creator standpoint, I think the idea is brilliant too because somebody else is coming up with the questions every yeah. time. You know, so absolutely, um, and and it allows me to bring a whole bunch of different types of guests on. You know, people of all level can be on the podcast. So I'll put that invitation out as well. You know, if you want to be on the podcast as an aspiring investor, or if you have some experience under your belt you know, reach out to me as well, you know, DM me on, on LinkedIn or send me an email and just say, Hey, I want to be on the podcast. And, you know, the answer is probably going to be yes is so just get that out of there. I'm not going to say no. That That's a, a, a great invitation folks. And, and Brian, I want to thank you again so much for coming on to the podcast and thank you for the time. Thank you.